I don't want to like just set aside the architecture of like 01, 03, but I also do want to set aside the architecture because I think to dismiss it as a pile of hacks or this is just a new algorithmic change instead of like a model to rule them all, that is not an insult. That's how sort of progress happens. Mm -hmm. And I think actually, um, speaking of Doug, uh, him and Dylan, or maybe it was Dylan, had an article about, about scaling before that made the point that, oh, the reason why, you know, if you have inference time scaling, which I wrote about earlier this year when, when sort of O1 came out, there's sort of a, a, a theoretical argument that sort of came up ar around this, which is, well, no, that's cheating. We were told the scaling was on the model. You just make the models bigger and they get better. You can't say the scaling somewhere else. And what I really liked is, is Dylan made an uh, analogy to Moore's law, which Moore's law, the, the way in which it progressed was Moore's law itself was linear, but the, com the, the axes of, of improvement continually changed. So, mm -hmm. For a lot of people listening, all the knowledge and awareness of semiconductor manufacturing has been about lithography, EUV, EUV, ASML. And that was the main vector of sort of improvement in Moore's law and making chips smaller and more efficient over the last 10 years, 10 to 15 years. Before that, lithography wasn't that big of a deal. It was kind of a real, really big deal in the 80s and 90s when, when the Japanese really took over. And there was a bit where we went to immersion lithography, and that was a big deal. But there were other aspects that actually really mattered. There was, you know, whether it be sort of sort of the, the metallurgy that goes into it in different materials or mm -hmm. transistor design. When we went to 3D transistors, it was called the FinFET transition, where you used to have planar transistors, which were more 2D. Then suddenly you're stacking. If you think about it, we are, these chips on uh, used to be sort of all these flat gates. Then they went basically became like skyscrapers where they went up and down in addition side to side. Just th just if you just can envision that, what an incredible shift that was, right? But if you zoom out and look over the the, the period of, of processor change from the '60s till now, it looks like a fairly continuous curve that has flattened a bit. And it, right. it does continue to flatten somewhat, but it, it's like a continuous, smooth improvement. But that improvement was driven by by focusing on different things at different at, so at different, different times. Vector, diff, different vectors depending. That's on right. You hit decade. a wall. You hit a wall in one era, so you start. What what else can we improve? We're talking yeah. about a process that is thousands of steps. All those steps can be transformed and changed, and you can sort of do new things. And that applies, I think, generally. And in this case, the sort of scaling question, the reason why O one was a big deal when it came out, and honestly, I think O three, what it's super impressive, and the results are amazing. Mm -hmm. I personally wasn't as blown away, but that's because I was blown away by O one. Because what O1 showed is, yes, we, before with all the LM models, it's like all the scaling was on the front. You make bigger and bigger models with more and more data and apply more and more processes to it. You get smarter and smarter models. Suddenly with O1, it's like, okay, wait, this is the same in broad strokes base model as GPT-4. What's right. different is that when you're asking it to do an answer, it's spending more time. And critically, the more time it spends i.e. the more compute it uses, the better the answer is. That then that's what Doug is, is talking about here. It, it, it's you and, and the big thing here, and this is sort of the, the big theme that I'm thinking about. And, and you know, like my what's my gonna be my opening article of the year. I don't want to sort of oh give boy. too much away. But I think there's a there's a counterintuitive reality here, which is we're moving from a time of it's, there's almost like a, a broader media analogy mm -hmm. to a certain extent where, you know, you talk about sort of the post-World War II consensus and everyone watched TV and there was the nightly news and everyone had the accepted same set of facts. And, and there was debates and there was right and left and Democrats and Republicans or whatever it might be. But actually, it all sort of operated within a pretty narrow bound. And this this applies to the stuff we've talked about when it comes with with things like trade and globalization and, and questions on those lines. And one of the things that's happening, and this sort of came up during COVID, where I think a critical mistake that was made in COVID was a deference to experts. And the problem is experts are expert in their specific domain, mm -hmm. but political decisions sort of by definition encompass multiple domains. It's about making trade-offs. It's a trade-off between sort of 
limiting the spread versus kids need to go to school versus businesses need to stay in business versus right. hospitals overwhelmed. Just to choose, like, I think I just picked two on both sides that argue for one direction or the other. And there was a certain sort of abdication of responsibility amongst the political class by deferring to experts, but the deferring to experts was itself a political choice because you were mm -hmm. foregoing the responsibility of making a trade-off. There was, there was, there was a- experts don't have a priority stack per se. They have, or at least they are likely to lean heavily on their area of expertise in terms of what they're prioritizing. That's exactly right. That's thing. exactly yeah. right. And so guess what? The public health officials think we should do the maximum amount of thing for public health. They're not thinking about the economics. They're not thinking about kids' educational outcomes. They're not thinking about like, what's the implications of people getting turned off to all vaccines instead of just or, this yeah. vaccine, right? You're like, there, <laughs> there's, it works, like, like if you go to a lawyer and say, should I publish this? I might get sued. The lawyer every single time will say, do not publish that. Oh, do not say that. The, this is one of the best lessons I learned at Microsoft early on. Because when I was at Microsoft, we were still under consent decrees from the from – the, uh, uh, the, You the just lawsuit. got softer. Did you, did you hit mute? Sorry, I thought I had mute on. I turned it off. I'm always oh. good. No, this is a lesson I learned at Microsoft because uh, when I was at Microsoft in, in the uh, 2010, 20, or 2011, 2012 era, we were still under consent decrees or some of them were just rolling off from sort of the, the Justice Department sort of thing. And of course, you got the whole talk about there's certain words you don't use, especially yep. in email. <laughs> um, but but one of the key things that that my manager sort of told me, he's like, look, a big mistake people make in general, but here in particular is they overly defer to, I think it was called LSA, or legal services or whatever. They, mm -hmm. like, but they, they, they listen to the lawyers too much. He's like, the, the lawyer's job is to inform you of the risks. It's your job to make a decision. Like, like, and sometimes you're going to do what the lawyer doesn't want you to because you weighed the risk, you understood the issue, but you you were thinking about the bigger picture. It's not their right. job to think about the bigger picture. So you, the lawyer example is a great example. And you see lots of folks paralyzed and lots of companies sort of get all tied up in this. And I think we witnessed this to a certain extent, you know, arguably this stuff has happened with Google and it could be uh, lawyer stuff. It could be sort of like, the political PR. fervor sort of aspects. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, like as a manager, your job is to make decisions is to make trade-offs as a politician. Your job is to make decisions to make trade-offs. And then you get held accountable for that as a manager. If it worked out, you get promoted. If it doesn't, you're out the door. If you're a politician, ideally you get reelected. If you don't, you're out the door. That's the way it's supposed to work. But there's a large extent to which I think society generally got away from that and I think that was probably the case with tech. And that's something I think that, that Doug is getting at here. The sort of decisions, the architectural decisions, sort of what you do were easy in a certain sense because what in theory is a big decision, like how much do I spend on this, was not a decision at all. You spend the maximum amount possible. What, like I think there was, a, I don't know if it was in this question, but we had sort of like the zero interest rate environment was sort of a, a portion of this. And you have these sort of SaaS mm -hmm. companies where, you know, there's this famous cohort map that, that actually I, I helped create back in the day where, you know, how do you measure, oh, you show the profitability of a cohort increasing over time. And what you have to do is convince investors that that's gonna apply to sort of every cohort going, going, going backwards over time. And so, yeah, of course we're losing a lot of money. In fact, we should be losing more money because in the long run, these customers are going to make more money. Obviously that leads to all sorts of, problematic decision making but it was a reasonable way to think about sort of the, the these markets and you could do that because your cost of servicing these customers was effectively zero it was sort of zero right. marginal cost the imp to the circle back to the implications of sort of the 01 and 03 if sort of your performance is tied to your compute and if your compute has meaningful costs suddenly there's a new decision you have to make on sort of a continual basis mm -hmm. is what's it worth to get this right? Like, or what's it worth to get to, or sometimes the answer is not yes or no. If it, in some, this actually reemphasizes the point, the problem with decision-making is there's so much uncertainty. You actually don't know what the answer is. So it's, right. it's very satisfying to hand it off to the experts. Hey, the experts said do this, but the, as, to go back to the COVID example, all those things that I raised, 
just because I raised them doesn't mean the answers were obvious. The whole point is the answers were not obvious. And even looking back, not all the answers were sort of obvious to all these sorts of sorts, sorts of things. And so you have to, in a, in a bit of uncertainty, it's not just how much do I want to spend to get the right answer. It's how much do I want to spend to get a proportionally more likely to be right answer. And at mm -hmm. some point you have to make the choice. You just sort of have to go. And um, and yeah, that's going to be a fundamentally different skill, fundamentally different decision making apparatus, and I think a, uh, some fundamentally different business models. So I'm sort of rambling here, but obviously I've had two weeks to sort of. Think <laughs>